Hi everyone, Jennifer here. Welcome to the Chic Assignment Check-In for May. Welcome back to The Daily Connoisseur. I don't know about you, but I am loving this month's assignments. We have a lot to discuss, so let's just jump right into it. Okay, the first assignment was to listen to Eric Satie's Gymnopedes, and I left you a YouTube video that you could watch and listen to, and this video is just amazing. I love it. It's set to art, and it has the Gymnopedes, and if you actually let it play, this is what I found, because I did this a few times this month, it goes into other similar videos on YouTube and it's just been amazing. I love them. And this video has been seen or listened to 20 million times, which is pretty incredible. And that actually gives me hope for this world. So the Gymnopedes are hauntingly beautiful works. And just depending on who you talk to, some people love them and they think they're beautiful. Others think they're a bit dark, a bit depressing. Some people recognize them from movies. They're very famous. So it's just been neat hearing from a lot of you. And many of you said, oh, I've heard this song before, but I never knew who the composer was. So that's what's so neat about the Chic Assignment here is we're diving in deeper. I hope some of you are also doing this with your children too, because they will pick up on this as well. Each month as I assign something new, I also talk about it with my children. And my hope is that, you know, when they're somewhere and they hear one of these famous classical pieces, that they'll be able to remember who the composer was and just appreciate it a bit more. So we've been listening to the pieces a few times this month. Not every day, but every other day, every third day or so. And right now we're undergoing a kitchen renovation in our home, so it's very chaotic right now. We're displaced. Um, we don't have access to our kitchen. Our house is a mess downstairs. Everything's in boxes, and it's just been chaotic. So to counterbalance the chaos, I have been playing Satie. You know, I think it's just really calmed everybody down. And I had that YouTube video up on our TV while we were listening to it. And this is just remarkable. I couldn't believe this. My two-year-old son, okay, and he's, he's very verbal and he's, um, you know, verbally very advanced for his age. He was looking at the television while we were listening to the pieces and he said, Mommy, is that Paris? Because you know, it's showing famous artwork too of Paris. And it wasn't even a painting of the Eiffel Tower. It was just of a street in Paris. And I couldn't believe that my two-year-old was noticing that that was Paris. You know what I mean? I mean, it was unbelievable. And I think it's because he was watching the footage with me of when Notre Dame was burning and that was like seared in his memory. So he kept saying, where's the fire? Where's the fire? Oh my gosh. So that was heartbreaking, but it was also just amazing to just show how much children can absorb and we need to give them the credit. We need to let them rise to the occasion and put beautiful things in front of them and allow them to listen to beautiful things because they will appreciate it and they will recognize it. I mean, a two-year-old can recognize a painting about Paris. How cool is that? These pieces have been really great for me this month because they are relaxing, they're beautiful, they counteract the crazy, as it were. And so I'm just absolutely loving them. Okay, so just a little bit about the composer. Satie was an eccentric, okay? He was introduced as a gymnopedist in 1887, shortly before writing his most famous compositions, the Gymnopedes. Later, he also referred to himself as a phonometrician, meaning someone who measures sounds, preferring this designation to that of musician. So he preferred to be called a phonometrician. Another interesting thing about him was that he was a writer as well, so he was a man of many talents. It says, in addition to his body of music, Satie was a thinker with a gift of eloquence who left a remarkable set of writings, having contributed work for a range of publications, including Vanity Fair. He also wrote under different pseudonyms. So Eric Satie was definitely uh, eccentric. You know, he was an avant-garde but he was extremely talented and we all are still moved by his work today. So there's so much more that you can learn about him and perhaps we will probably come back to him at a future Chic assignment because obviously he has many more compositions that we could study. But I really enjoyed learning about Satie. Please leave your observations below if you have anything to say. How did your children like the music? What did your family think? Um, what did you think? Did it help you? I like listening to this at twilight time and I, it helps me to unwind. And I also like listening to it when I'm stressed out or during chaotic moments in my life. So I've really enjoyed this. Okay, next we are gonna talk about Renoir. 
Now, as a fun experiment, because I know everyone's going to tell me I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I'm going to look up the pronunciation online with you right now. Pierre Auguste Renoir. Let's listen to that again. Pierre Auguste Renoir. 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 <laughs> okay. I tried, okay? So there's my there's my attempt. His name is hard for me to pronounce. So I um, suggested that you look at his 12 most popular works and to just share which one is your favorite. My top three are The Luncheon of the Boating Party, which is probably his most famous work, along with The Dance at the Moulin de la Galette. That one is incredible. I love both of those scenes. One of them is of a big party. The other one is of a more intimate gathering, a luncheon. Uh, but perhaps my favorite is the one of the two young girls at the piano. And I just like this one because it reminds me of my own daughters who play the piano. And it's just so sweet and beautiful. So let's get started with that one. And I just want to just read a little bit about it so we can all know a bit more about it. Okay, Young Girls at the Piano is an oil on canvas painting by Pierre-Auguste Renoir, a leading painter in the development of the Impressionist style. It was completed in 1892 as an informal commission for the Musée du Luxembourg. Renoir painted three older variations of this composition in oil and two sketches. Okay, so this can answer a question that I had. I noticed that with a lot of his most famous uh, paintings that there were two or three of them, and I was always confused by that. It says, Pissarro and Monet routinely painted series of variations on a single theme, but their works were intended to be shown together to chronicle the effects of light and atmosphere, while Renoir's repetitions were independent essays in composition, so he would actually paint things two or three times, which explains that. Renoir depicts two young girls at a piano in a bourgeois home, one in a white dress and a blue sash, seated playing, and one in a pink dress standing. Renoir completed three additional versions of this composition in oil for collectors. The Luxembourg version is now housed at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. The Robert Lehman Collection version is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, while the Kaibot version and one other are in private collections. An oil sketch of the composition is on display at the Musée L'Orangerie in Paris, and a pastel sketch is in a private collection. So there's four of these, uh, but the most famous one, painted in 1892, is at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And this one is... I love this one. Don't you love this one? It's so beautiful. So. I've been doing a lot of studying um, because, you know, we homeschool our kids and we are moving more and more toward the Charlotte Mason method of homeschooling. And so I have been devouring these um, podcasts and also reading Charlotte Mason's own works. And one of her philosophies is that atmosphere sets the affection. Let me say this again. Atmosphere sets the affection, and I will be exploring this in a separate video because it not only affects children, but you know, adults as well. The idea that what we surround ourselves sets what we are affectionate for. In the Charlotte Mason philosophy, children are viewed as persons. And so if we give them high expectations, high art, high music, uh, beautiful things to surround themselves with, that's what they will find themselves affectionate toward. So anyway, that's a long-winded way of me saying that I would actually like to surround uh, my children with beautiful artwork. Um, just like this. So I plan on getting this, um, a copy of course, of The Girls at the Piano by Renoir and, and having it framed and putting it in uh, one of my daughter's rooms. And you know, I'm just going to find beautiful artworks that are famous and get them framed and put them uh, in their rooms because I want them to just be surrounded by this type of thing and have their affection toward fine art. Anyway, I'm going to leave all of these reproductions um, listed down below because you can get them on a website called art.com and you can get them in different sizes, you can get them framed. So if you want to have this artwork in your home, you know, that's a wonderful place to do it. But I would love to put that in their bedroom. But anyway, I will leave these linked below if you are interested. I just love the girls at the piano. I love it because 
it's just so lifelike and it just depicts two girls i'm assuming they're sisters and they remind me of my own girls because my own girls look very different one of them is blonde with curly hair one of them has dark straight brown hair and they're often at the piano looking at songs deciphering notes just i've seen this scene in my own home so i just love it it's so near and dear to my heart i love it okay so next i want to talk about the luncheon of the boating party the déjeuner de canotier i absolutely adore this painting and um, you know I'm sure that this is many of your favorites too and what's really neat is that Renoir often included his friends in uh, his portraits so in the bottom right corner there you'll see the man sitting in the backward chair with the boating hat on his head that is Gustav Kaibot who is also a very famous um, painter and I'm sure that we will be studying him at some point in the chic assignment also, the lady sitting with the little dog in the bottom left-hand corner, that is Aline Cherigot. Uh, she has an Affin Pincher dog there, and that is his future wife. So when he's painting this, they're not yet married. But he married her in 1890, and they had three sons together. Isn't that neat? But I just love this. Uh, I love this painting. So on the table, you see wine, you see fruit. They're having a casual... French lunch. It looks like lunch is finished. It was a lively lunch. Everyone is discussing things. They're in conversation. Have you ever just had one of those lunches al fresco, you know, with a really lively, wonderful group of people, and it's just an amazing afternoon and you don't want it to end? That looks like what this is, um, and it's just... I love it. I don't know. Maybe because I'm in that mom phase in the trenches where we don't really go out much. <laughs> you know, you don't really see any babies in high chairs in this scene. And so that's why I'm just loving looking at it. But I think it's fantastic. And then the other one that I absolutely love is the dance at the Moulin de la Galette. That was painted in 1876. It's housed at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And it's just amazing. It's one of Impressionism's most celebrated masterpieces. The painting depicts a typical Sunday afternoon at the original Moulin de la Galette in the district of Montmartre in Paris. In the late 19th century, working-class Parisians would dress up and they would spend time there dancing, drinking, and eating galettes or cakes into the evening. Other works of Renoir's early maturity, Bal de Moulin de la Galette is a typically impressionist snapshot of real life. It shows a richness of form, a fluidity of brushstroke, and a flickering sun-dappled light. So this is interesting. From 1879 to 1894, the painting was in the collection of Gustave Caillebotte, so that was his painting friend. And when he died, it became the property of the French Republic because of death duties. So there are different versions of this painting as well, and I love it. It just captures a slice of life that wouldn't we all love to be there right now to just look at that and just see uh, I love the clothing I love the atmosphere everyone looks like they're having a great time I see some children in the front which I actually didn't notice before but it just looks like an amazing Parisian afternoon and um, I love it I would love to hear what you think about uh, this down below the absolute best class that I took when I well, in my entire schooling experience was the art history class that I took when I was living in Paris because on Monday we would discuss the paintings in class and then on Wednesday we would actually go to a museum and look at them in person and my professor was so knowledgeable uh, if you've read lessons from Madame Chic, he was the one that noticed the pimple on my nose. That's a whole other story. <laughs> but I just have such fond memories from that period of time. It was like the renaissance of my life. It was just incredible. So I feel really blessed to have experienced that. And those are my favorite Renoirs. Before I move on to the next Chic assignment, I have got to mention this before I forget, but we are obviously continuing to read this month, and um, I am reading through the Ashley Weaver's mystery series, but I also announced that we are going to be continuing the Map and Lucia book club. The books are by E.F. Benson. I will leave that um, blog featured below where I talk about it, and I hope that you join us for that. Okay, I keep forgetting to mention that, so I wanted to get that in there. Okay, the next assignment for the chic assignment was to pay attention to your jewelry. And many of us are in the habit of wearing our newer pieces or just pieces that we just 
happen to wear all the time. Maybe we just keep little studs in our ears and we just never change them out. But many of us have other pieces. Maybe they were given to us as gifts or they're a bit nicer and we just never wear them. So this month we were going to be bringing them out and I've been doing that all month and I've really been enjoying it, just paying more attention to my jewelry. So in one of my outfit of the week videos, I mentioned this pretty bracelet that I unearthed. This was given to me by Ben at the beginning of our marriage and it's just a beautiful aquamarine bracelet and I think it's so pretty. So here's my funny story about that. Ben, you know Ben, my husband, Mr. Connoisseur, he's okay with me saying this, but he's never been a romantic type uh, person. I don't know, is that an Englishman thing? Can you tell me, any of you who are married to Englishmen? <laughs> But he's not like, you know, he, he, and he'll admit this, he's not like the type that just is totally romantic. In fact, he's very English in that sense. Can I say that? It's not an insult. You know, obviously I married the man, so I love him. But when we were first married, um, there was no particular occasion. And we were just driving along, and uh, he, I think we were going on a trip to Palm Springs. It was just him and me, and we didn't have kids yet. And, you know, we, we started driving the car and he said, oh, by the way, look in the, um, look in the, the partition, you know, the little, the little thing in the middle of the car in between the, the driver's seat and the passenger seat. He said, lift it up. There's something in there for you. I got you something. And so I thought he got me like a candy bar or something, <laughs> but I lifted it up and there was this bracelet and I was so moved and I thought, you know, that's about as romantic as it gets with Ben. <laughs> and I just never forgot that. So I brought this bracelet out and I remembered that all over again. And I thought for him, that was very sweet. So he, he bought me this beautiful bracelet and I uh, am going to enjoy wearing it again. I showed, I showed it to him and he said, oh yeah, I remember that bracelet, you know. <laughs> and by the way, we are celebrating our 13th wedding anniversary today. Yes, today, the day that you're seeing this video. So that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Final chic assignment was to get manicure and pedicure ready. So you probably notice I don't actually have any color on my hands. I took off my nail polish last night and I'm going to be giving myself a manicure and a pedicure today. But I have been filming them for you and I hope that you've been enjoying them. I try to make them really beautiful and relaxing and something that's nice for you to watch as well. I have a, a video coming out where I show you my peach manicure and I used almond oil in the the process. So it's just a wonderful thing for self-care. I might go with blue next. I'm not sure. But anyway, this is the tool for your feet. This is the pedicure tool I was talking about. I have used everything. I used that little thing that you press the button and it kind of files your foot. I've used that. That was really popular for a long time. I've used one of these that were smaller and um, it has like something to collect the dead skin, which actually is a nice feature, but it didn't do so well. This thing was reviewed well on Amazon and I thought, okay, I've got to try this. It is, I don't even know what this is called. It doesn't even have anything on it. What's it? Microplane? I'll link it down below. This is incredible. My feet get really dry. You just rub this on your heels, it's gone. All of the dead skin gone, your feet look amazing and it's very inexpensive. So I highly recommend this. I will leave this linked below. This is an absolute must for me for getting pedicure ready. Sandals, I wanted to show you. I mentioned I might get the Sam Edelman in Leopard, and I did. And these are gonna highlight my pedicure well. Of course, I can't wear these with everything, but just like Hillary from Old World Home says, Leopard is a neutral, and I totally agree with that. And I will wear this with many things. So I'm excited to have a new pair of sandals. Before we go, I just wanna highlight some of the readers of The Daily Connoisseur because we have very talented women who watch this channel and who are a part of it. And I mean, you're all talented in your own way. Do you know what I mean? But I've had a few writers uh, reach out to me and this one is Amanda Dykes and she just put out a book and it's called Whose Waves These Are and it's a novel. She sent it to me. I have not read it yet, but it looks so good and it says, in the wake of World War II, a grieving fisherman submits a poem to a local newspaper, a rallying cry for hope, purpose, and rocks. Its message, send me a rock for the person you lost and I will build something life-giving. So this book looks really good and it's written by uh, an, a reader of The Daily Connoisseur. So I will leave it linked below. 
Another one I wanted to mention, I don't have a copy in front of me, but a longtime reader of The Daily Connoisseur, and her name is Jody Alexander Fry. She has written a book called Questions at the School Gate, A Shy Mum's Real Life Experiment. And it was all about the social awkwardness of the school playground as a parent and about how to make friends when you feel shy. And I will leave her book down below. I also have some other wonderful writers that I will feature in future Chic Assignments. So uh, I just want to thank you all. I know a lot of you write to me and I just appreciate it so, so much. Okay, that is it for the Chic Assignment check-in for May. I would love to hear your thoughts on any and all topics down below. Isn't it nice that we can get together like this and just have some culture? It just feels good, right? I would love to hear from you. Please leave us your comment below. And thank you very much. I will see you next time on The Daily Connoisseur. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.